<laughs> I'm Gabby from TechFest and welcome to tonight's talk. This is our last talk of this program. Uh, so hopefully you will you will um, enjoy. And uh, none of this would have been possible without our principal sponsors, um, VP and Shell, and also Equinor, who are our uh, public program sponsor. So a huge thank you to them. And uh, if uh, you're looking for the bathroom, they're just uh, right outside on the right hand side. And the fire exit is through there. And the assembly point is just between the Meston and the library buildings. And uh, that's pretty much it. We have some QR codes if you would like to leave your feedback after the talk. And they are just outside, uh, outside in the reception area. Uh, otherwise, we'll send you an email. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can leave us your feedback that way. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the talk. Pulling some pretty colors to show. <laughs> um, that's uh, a sunrise looking out from Aberdeen Royal Infirmary one morning, uh, early 2000s. That was. Uh, I know because uh, we don't have this view anymore because we're busy building a brand new anchor center that blocks the view, but uh, we're very pleased to have the anchor center, obviously. Um, and I gather most people will know what radiotherapy is. So radiotherapy, we're using radiation to treat cancer. Um, and uh, that's me, and I lead a small team, and we're involved in the technological side of things. We, involve, we know about radiation, we know about machines, we know a little bit about computers, not as much as we'd like. Um, but that's us. And so we're all involved in developing new technologies with the goal of making better cancer treatments. So this talk is a bit of a, a journey through radiotherapy as it developed, so you can understand how the technology developed, with a focus on Aberdeen, what we have locally, um, which turns out to be pretty cutting edge stuff these days. So moving on, uh, so let's start at the start. Röntgen in 1895 discovered x-rays. So he had this little vacuum tube, a cathode ray tube. And from this, he was uh, detected mysterious rays that seemed to pass through uh, people's bodies. He could put a photographic plate behind them and make a nice little picture. The first thing he did was call his wife and says, oh, honey, come here. Can you put your hand there for a minute? <laughs> the first picture he took was his wife's hand. Uh, a little while later, his friend Albert showed, must have come for a visit, so he took a picture of his friend's left hand, Albert. Um, and that was 1895. Uh, only three years later, Pierre and Marie Curie discovered radium and polonium. Um, so it was a very exciting time in, in physics uh, in those days. Um, and this is a picture of uh, uh, Marie Curie and uh, her husband, Pierre. This is um, Henri Becquerel, was Marie's PhD advisor. And the story goes that he, through careful negotiation, managed to borrow a small vial of radium from Marie Curie. And he thought, good, I'll take this back to my own lab, which was across Paris. And he stuck it in the vest pocket, and he headed off back across Paris got back to his own lab and stuck it on the shelf. He thought, great. And within a few days, there was a bright skin near at the end, like a sunburn almost that appeared on his chest. And normal people would be horrified, but he was a physicist and decided, great, this is an opportunity to write a paper. And he wrote a whole paper about how the, the lesion developed and the actual breakdown of the skin and that sort of stuff. But it was an example of how very early on people realized that this mysterious x-rays and whatever was coming out of radium could be used to actually treat uh, skin lesions and cancers and things like that. Rather than a, a surgeon's scalpel, you could uh, eradicate these things with radiation. So the first radiotherapy treatment was actually in 1896, just a year after Rumpkin discovered x-rays. So they didn't hang about in those days, you know. Um, so how does radiation damage cells? And mostly it's the damage to DNA that, that causes the effects from radiation. So I've shown 
what's called an alpha particle crossing a representation of DNA molecule and damaging it. Um, and if you damage DNA enough, the cell sort of is no longer able to divide it, and it has a mechanism called apoptosis where it realizes something's wrong or well, it just self-destruct and the cells die off. And that's how radiation damages tissues. Um, but it turns out cancer cells are not quite as good as most of our normal cells at repairing the damage from, uh, from radiation. So right away, your normal cells have kind of an advantage over cancer cells. But we can't just go around irradiating somebody's whole body and hope that we'll kill off all the cancer cells. Right? Instead, what we do is we try and focus the radiation on the bit we're trying to treat. So several beams can be used at once, uh, as I sort of tried to show here with three beams incident on a region we're trying to treat uh, to a high radiation dose and preserve the, the tissues around it so they don't get too much radiation damage and they repair themselves. Whereas the tumor that we're aiming for, it, we just destroy it. That's the idea. So we can use beams of radiation in much the same way that a surgeon might use a scalpel to try and excise this tumor. With the slight advantage that the normal cells in that region are going to likely survive and populate that region. So that's the principle of radiotherapy. Now, it turns out that x-rays coming off Röntgen's mysterious, or Ms. Röntgen's mysterious rays coming off his x-ray tube uh, are not very penetrating. So if you try to treat things deep in the body, that's not the right kind of beam to use. You can treat superficial things, but not things deep down. It wasn't until the 1950s that high energy machines became available. And actually the earliest high energy machines use a radioactive substance called cobalt um, that was produced in a nuclear reactor. Um, it was a Canadian invention, so I like to highlight it because that's where I grew up. Um, so this is a, an early uh, cobalt treatment and they're treating something deep in the pelvis. So it's the first time that they're they've been able to do that. You couldn't really do it with x-rays properly. So higher energy radiations led to much better treatments and a broader range of treatments that you could do with radiotherapy. And then after the Second World War, or during the Second World War, the linear accelerator was invented at Stanford, uh, Stanford University, and it could produce beams that were much more energetic than a, a simple cobalt machine. Um, so we had even high energy, more penetrating beams so we could concentrate the radiation even better into deep targets within the body. Um, so linear, LINAC is just short for linear accelerator. Um, and LINACs can produce both X-rays and electron beams. So they're, in addition to uh, being more penetrating, they're a little more flexible than a cobalt unit. Uh, this is a famous picture of uh, Lee Gordon Isaacs sitting on the, the bed, uh, possibly just before, just after receiving a treatment. Um, and that monstrosity behind him is an early LINAC. And he was treated for something called retinoblastoma, which is a, a tumor in the eye. Yeah, so he had a retinoblastoma in his left eye. He was treated by a consultant called Myers, um, and it was successful. They saved his sight in his left eye. He obviously survived, and he may yet still be alive. This is from 1957, so it wasn't actually that long ago. Uh, so an early success story for radiotherapy, and that kind of success to just spur further development. Uh, and now Linux are the most common technology used in radiotherapy. That's 99% you know, of our treatments these days. Um, so what was going on in Aberdeen about this time? Well, actually radiotherapy in Aberdeen dates right back to the 1900s. I did come across an old uh, log book where somebody was talking about managing to get a hold of some radium uh, and uh, they were very excited because they could begin radium treatments. So that, that was a long time ago, but it wasn't until 1988 that Aberdeen got its first high energy than that. Uh, so this is it during installation. That's my predecessor standing there, Graham Robertson. 
And um, you'll note that this is where the beam emerges. So the beam emerges here going downwards like that. But this whole thing can actually spin. So this beam doesn't have to go downwards. We can angle it any direction we want towards some central point. And if you put the thing you're trying to treat at that central point, the beam will always be pointing at it. So you can bring in beams from different directions all around the patient. That's called an isocentric gantry, iso meaning one, and centric center, so one center. And all Linux in the world are isocentric uh, these days. So by the, by the time this was being installed in 1988, that was what Linux did. So treatments in the early days went something like this. We had uh, an X-ray machine, this thing here, on the left, that's called, uh, we called it a simulator because it simulated a linear accelerator, but it wasn't a LINAC, it was just a simple X-ray machine that took pictures. It didn't deliver the treatment at all, but it could take a picture of what you were trying to treat. So the patient would lie on, a, on the couch, you can just make out here that would move into the middle there, and you can decide how big the radiation beam is gonna be, what part of the body you're treating. Um, and you can see it on the imager, this, this thing at the bottom called the image intensifier. And so you can take a picture. Then the next step was lots of data tables, pen, paper, a calculator, and you figured out all the parameters you needed to know to deliver the amount of radiation that the oncologist was prescribing. So it was all very manual. Uh, we did have computers, obviously, to simplify things and so on. Uh, and then once all those calculations were done, the patient could go on for, to treatment on the linear accelerator. And that was the process. So simulation, calculation, treatment. And that's, that's the way things went. But there's a bit of a problem. So you, you're designing the treatment on one machine and delivering it on another. Well, how do I know that the thing I was looking at in the simulator on the x-ray machine is the thing I'm now going to treat on the treatment machine. That's a, that's a bit tricky. So the way we got around that, or still get around that, is on the patient that I've sort of represented there in gray, we put marks on the outside of the skin, these little tattoos. Um, and we're trying desperately to get rid of tattoos because obviously people don't want tattoos, uh, these little permanent marks. Anyways, we put uh, marks on the skin, and then we have these lasers at the side of the room that are aligned with the center of that machine. Remember, they rotate around a particular center, so we have these lasers that line up with the center. The lasers aren't big, powerful ones. They're like a, a laser pointer sort of laser. And they point uh, to isocenter, and so we can line the marks up on the skin uh, in the simulator, you put marks on the skin, but then you go over to the treatment machine, which has a similar set of lasers, and you line those marks up with those lasers, and then you know you're in the right spot and you can deliver the treatment. So that, that's how everything was lined up from one machine to the other. Okay. Then things took another step forward. In the early 2000s, we got these uh, more advanced machines that were called Clinax, so Varian Clinax, that's about 2004. The fellow on the couch is actually one of our radiographers still with us. He's just retired, but he comes back to work with us a couple of days a week. Uh, Martin, in case anybody's seen at him. <laughs> so that's Martin on the couch. Uh, Jackie's still with us on the far side as well. Um, so, uh, these Linux, the new ones, had a couple of tricks that made treatment somewhat more advanced than we could deliver on the, the old machine that we had before that. The one that you saw installed in 1988, these two one, new ones from 2000, to do something called advanced beam shaping. So they had something called multi-leaf collimators. Sounds very fancy. So what I'm showing here on the left is the treatment head of the linear accelerator with all the, without all the nice covers on it, so you can see all the gubbins inside. And I've drawn in purple where the beam emerges. Obviously, the beam's invisible. You can't actually see it in real life. I'm just showing you where it's coming out of the machine, going downwards in this case, like that. 
And just in here, I don't know if you can see, but the, you have these little blades, and these blades can move individually. We call them leaves. And there's multiple leaves, hence a multi leaf collimator. And imagine you're at the radiation source looking down on the patient, uh, something we call beam's eye view. And this is what you see on the right. And these leaves are uh, of colored blue here. We've shaped them to try and treat the things that we're trying to deliver radiation to and shield the bits that we don't want to treat. So that's what multi leaf collimators do for us. Uh, about or just a few years after we got these fancy new lineups, we got a CT scanner of our very own. So uh, it used to be if we wanted a CT scan, they would have to the patients would have to go to the opposite end of the hospital and get a, a scan and come back and that sort of thing. Now with our own scanner, we could do much fancier things. So things started to get quite sophisticated, and this is an example of a treatment that we used to deliver specifically for prostate cancer in this case, where we have four beams. So one from above, uh, one from below, um, the patient's right and the patient's left, coming in from four different directions. So we rotate the gantry one direction and we rotate it around, deliver beam from the side, beam from below, beam from the other side. And the other thing we do is we deliver the beams fairly wide at first, and then comb them down as the treatment goes on, make it go tighter and tighter and concentrate the dose where we want it. So for instance, uh, the prostate lies in the middle here and the colors mean different radiation intensities. We call it radiation dose. Uh, so the reds are high radiation dose, the blue somewhat lower. And the, we know the cancer is in the prostate, but there's a risk of it having spread to the uh, lymph lymphatic nodes around the pelvis. So we also deliver some dose, not as much to the prostate, but some dose to the surrounding uh, tissues uh, to try and take care of the microscopic disease. You can't see on a CT scan, but you know it's probably there, but it doesn't take as much radiation dose to kill those small number of cells. So that was, that's the beginning of what we call conformal therapy because we're conforming to the shape of the, the thing we're trying to treat. It used to be radiotherapy, it's just kind of regional. You treat the whole pelvis, but now we're cooling down and conforming to what we want to treat. The other trick new machines had is they've got these, had these fancy imaging devices. So I'm treating with x-rays, high energy x-rays, a lot higher energy than out of a normal x-ray tube, but I can still use them to take a picture. So these new machines had these imaging devices so there's uh, in a uh, representation of my patient and I've drawn what the beam would look like passing through the patient. Um, and on the left is an image that I could get from that portal imager. Uh, so we call the, uh, the beam the port. So the image you get from it is a portal image. And I can see what I'm aiming at. So now I can make out some of the bones of the pelvis and so on. So I can actually take a picture of the thing I'm treating. You remember the early days we would take a picture on a simulator. Now I can take a picture on the machine and know that I'm in the right place, not just relying on the skin marks. I can be much more precise about it. And it's the beginning of what we call image-guided radiotherapy. So we're actually using imaging on the machine to guide our targeting of the radiation. So let's put all that together. So we have our, our fancy new CT scanner. We can do these fancy new treatment plans, we call it, when we design that treatment uh, to cone in on the thing we're trying to treat, that's our treatment plan. Uh, and we can generate images of what that should look like when we go to treat it. So that image is like a synthetic one that says, this is what I expect to see on the treatment machine. And then we we'll go, at the time of treatment, there's our imager. We can actually take that picture and we go, does that picture look like the one that I thought it was going to look like? And I can move one image relative to the other until they line up. And then the machine, uh, has, uh, when we do that matching, tells us how much we have to move the treatment couch in order to get them to line up. 
we don't personally go into the room and move that couch very precisely, say we're in the right spot now, we're ready to go. And that's image guided radiotherapy. Okay. So, slight drawback to this, I can see bones all right. I can actually even see this uh, air within the bowel, but really I can't make out much in terms of soft tissue. So these images are good for seeing bones, but not soft tissues. Then around uh, in 2012, things changed quite a lot. This is the beginning of a real revolution in radiotherapy. And it sounds simple. I take a simple x-ray tube, like the one on the left. That's what, if you go to get your arm x-ray, that's what the x-ray tube actually looks like. And that's mounted in one of these new machines that we got in 2012 called the Varian True Beam. And the treatment beam emerges here. The imaging x-ray beam emerges there. And so I've got this extra imaging panel over here. Okay. So now I can take really high quality pictures of the thing I'm trying to treat. And because it's attached to this gantry, I know how to relate that image to the actual position of the patient. But that's not the real trick. The real trick is the fact that I've got this mounted, this x-ray tube mounted on a machine that goes round and round, and I've got an imaging panel. Well, that's pretty much what a CT scanner does. It's an x-ray tube that goes round and round and reconstructs a CT scan. So now suddenly, rather than just a plain old, a planar x-ray, I can reconstruct a whole CT scan. We call it cone beam CT. Uh, so it's a little bit different than diagnostic CT, but it's a CT scan. And now I can see not just, not just the bones, as you can see there, but there's the, the bladder I can see and that sort of stuff. You can see soft tissues. And the thing we're trying to avoid are often soft tissues, you know, kidneys and bladder and all that sort of stuff. We don't want to treat them. The thing we're trying to treat is often soft tissue as well. The tumor is not bone, it's soft. So now suddenly we can actually see the tissues that we're aiming for. So this is real, much more sophisticated image guidance. So now I've got the CT scan that I acquired at the time of treatment, and I got a CT scan that I acquired when I went to design the treatment at the start. And when the, with the patient on the couch, I can line them up in three dimensions. As a matter of fact, the software does that for us. So there's a fair bit of computer power on the treatment machine. It lines these two CT scans up. It obviously stops and says to the radiographers, are you happy with that? And the radiographers might tweak a bit and know that, that that's a better position there. And then the machine tells them, this is how much you have to move the couch. And they don't go back into the room anymore. They just press a button from outside and suddenly the bed moves. Anybody who's gone through this process knows that experience of the bed suddenly moving. Um, and then they know they're in the right spot. And it's not just the bones are in the right spot, but the thing they're actually trying to treat is in the right spot. So that's uh, image guided radiotherapy in all its glory. But there's another trick that these machines have, and that's to spin the gantry round. So here's the gantry going round and round and round. And you remember those multi-lead collimators that could shape the beam? Well, now these multi-lead collimators can move as the gantry goes round and round and round. So you remember the early times, I had four beams and I shaped them each, you know, I had four different shapes, at four different angles. Now imagine doing that at 180, 200 beams around the patient, any shape I want in each angle, you know, and different amounts of radiation from all these beams, I can really tailor the radiation to what I'm trying to treat. So here I show on the, on the left, that's the treatment we used to deliver for prostate when we thought we were doing pretty well with conformal therapy. Now, with this dynamic therapy, that's with the gantry moving, the MLC moving, here's what I'm delivering so much better, so conforms so much more to the thing I'm trying to treat. So you can see that the radiation conforms here to the target that's been drawn. And I don't have out here 
all this big dose to the hips that I had before. And I didn't want to treat bladder, so let's just make the radiation go around it or make the dose go around it. Uh, so it's so much better for the patient because we can deliver the same high dose that we want to deliver, but the patient uh, is much less likely to suffer severe side effects from the treatment itself, We're causing less damage to all the surrounding tissues. So it's a much, much better treatment. Uh, so on the left, that was before 2012. On the right, that was after 2012. Uh, and we went from old-fashioned conformal therapy to dynamic treatment. We call it volumetric modulated arc therapy, or VMAT for short. So if you ever come across VMAT, that's what they're talking about. Um, and basically, we, don't, we never look back. We do all our treatments now with VMAT because it's so much better. But things get a little bit complicated when you've got hundreds of beams, each with different shapes. It used to be that the way treatment plans were done is somebody literally looked at the CT scan and manually shaped the beam, said that's the shape of the beam I want, and this is how much radiation from the front, and this is how much from the side, and they put that into a computer and calculate the dose and say, oh, well, we'll give a little bit more from this side. That's pretty good. Then they get pretty quickly to the answer. Try doing that with 180 beams, and you're never going to get there. So what you have to do is hand the problem to a computer that searches millions of combinations of beams and configurations and beam weights and so on to come up with the best solution. Um, and we need a lot of computing power to do it. So actually these four computers in our computer rack are actually the ones that do all the big number crunching and, and uh, come up with these calculations. And the equation, uh, this isn't just an ar arbitrary equation, that's actually the equation it's, it's solving. That's called the uh, linear coupled steady state Boltzmann equations. Uh, so uh, there's no easy, you know, this equation equals, it's a numerical solution. It's got to be done by a computer and it needs a lot of computing power to do it. So now, yeah, we're super accurate now. We can conform very tightly to the thing we're trying to treat. But now we've got a new problem that we never had before. Because we're so conformed to the thing we're trying to treat, if that thing moves, we've got a problem. And people do insist on doing things like, you know, breathing. <laughs> um, so and if we keep them breathing, that's, that's what we're there for. So, um, so here's a picture of somebody uh, at, don't get this wrong now, this is full inhalation. No, that's exhalation and full inhalation. And there's a little gray blob, and that's a lesion in the lung that we're trying to treat. And it's moving as the patient breathes. And if we're trying to treat that and conform really tightly to that, how on earth are we going to do that if it keeps moving on us? Uh, so once again, technology comes to the rescue. So I'm not Rembrandt, but that is my representation of a patient. And on the patient's chest or upper abdomen, we have this little thing uh, called the, uh, it's reflector. We often call it a hippo. It's not an acronym or anything. We just thought that this little reflector looks a lot like a hippopotamus peeking up over the, the surface of the water with its two eyes and its nostrils there. So I put the hippo on the patient's chest or upper abdomen, and as they breathe, it obviously goes up and down, up and down. And so we watch the reflectors with a camera, and that's actually what the camera looks like on the, on the true beam, on the max anyways. And it's stereoscopic, so you can see how you know, measure in three dimensions where, where that uh, thing is, the reflector, the hippo, and it produces this trace. So the patient uh, breathes in, breathes out, breathes in, breathes out. We get this breathing trace. And we can now send that signal to the LINAC and tell it only to turn the beam on when this patient's in the right part of the breathing cycle. So we know the tumor is in the right spot when that beam comes on. And often what we do, we, we have what's called breath hold treatments. So in this case, we've asked the patient, hold your breath. 
and the patient will go, how deep? How deeply should I breathe? Just a little bit, not a lot. So what we do is we give them a little screen and then we put patients in control of the whole process because they're, they're the ones able to control the breathing. So we, they watch this little screen, they watch this white bar going up and down. And in here, we give them this little band and say, get that white bar into that green band and hold it there. And they say, oh, I can do that. Now I understand. I know how deeply I should breathe. And that's what they've done over here. They've got their breath hold between the two bands. This little purple line here means that's where the beam turned on. And if the patient goes, oh, I can't hold it anymore, the beam just stops. It sees the breathing trace drop out of the zone, stops. And then the radiographer says, that's okay. Just take your time. When you're ready, another deep breath, another deep breath, on comes the beam again. Two, three breath holds, the treatment's done. So that's how we do the, the motion control. So that's the jargon is uh, in, there's my dot. <laughs> motion management, that's the jargon uh, in the trade, so to speak. So we've got terrific technology. We can now deliver these radiotherapy treatments uh, better, than, better than we ever could before. Uh, and so we're doing things that one could, could never even have imagined. Um, but we don't now just treat things that we've treated for decades. You know, we've treated prostate a long, long time and it's got a lot better, but the new technology as technology always does creates new possibilities. And now new types of treatments are coming along um, that we couldn't imagine, that wouldn't have been an option for patients before now. <clears throat> Would not have been possible before we had this technology. And one of those is stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy, which is a real mouthful, but we pronounce this acronym SABER, so it's much easier to say. And SABER is a new kind of treatment. These are patients that would not have come for radiotherapy at all before. And initially it was used and still is used for very early stage lung cancer. Now the normal way to treat lung cancer at its very earliest stage is go for surgery and have it, the tumor excised. But there's a substantial group of patients that aren't suitable for surgery. So they're suffering from various comorbidities and, and it'd be just too risky to do a general anesthetic and attempt to recover from the surgery. Previously, there was no other option. You could send them perhaps for chemotherapy, but that was not a curative treatment, that was just palliative. But now with um, all the precision we've got in radiotherapy, they have a new option to treat these patients. And it's very successful. There's lots of trials to show that our rate of cure is very good in that group of patients. But there's also a new group uh, 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 with limited spread of their cancer. So um, there's a state of cancer we call oligometastases. Oligo means few, and metastases are the small lesions that might, have, might be growing because they've spread from a primary tumor. If there's just one, two, three of these tumors in various spots, that's a very early stage of spread. And uh, previously, you you would have done chemotherapy, watchful waiting, that sort of thing. But now with Sabre, we can actually go and treat these lesions. Um, so it's a new option for patients who previously didn't have an option for treatment. Uh, and it's such an important uh, type of treatment that we have a Scotland-wide group called the Scottish Oligometastasis Sabre Network. Uh, and that's working to roll treatment out across Scotland. I'm very pleased that Aberdeen is actually one of the leading centers in Scotland for delivery of Sabre. We're one of the few, well, one of only two centers in Scotland that can deliver Sabre to just about any anatomical site. So uh, we're quite at the forefront at the moment. And we're pleased about that. And it's because we've got all this nice technology uh, that we're able to do that sort of thing. So here's a few examples of the things we treat. So on the left, uh, we're treating this lesion here. That uh, this is actually a prostate cancer that's had a solitary spread of disease to a site in the bone. One single bone lesion, 
but otherwise the patient's well. So we want to treat that and we treat it to a very high dose. That's the, the A in Sabre is ablative, and ablative means you're just going to hit it so hard with radiation, you, you wipe out everything, it's blood supply, everything. So it completely destroy this tumor. And you can do it in three to five treatments. So it's actually a short course of radiotherapy. Um, and at the same time, they're so precise, we can avoid these major blood vessels here, and we can avoid these uh, important nerve bundles as well. So it's only because of our uh, uh, ability to uh, in position precisely that we can do these sorts of things. On the right, I've got a, a lesion that's actually a bit hard to make out. That's a solitary lymph node in somebody's pelvis. Again, metastases from a prostate cancer. And uh, other than that little lesion, the scan shows the patient doesn't have any other distant metastases. So if we can eliminate this metastases, that, that would make the, uh, the potential for a good outcome for this patient much better. The trouble with this site is there's lots of bowel nearby. And anybody who's heard their tummy rumble know, knows that bowels move around inside your stomach. So uh, very mobile sort of organ. And the thing we're trying to treat, we were afraid we, we would be cautious of treating the bowel to high dose. We don't want to do that. We want to keep the bowel away. But we've got this great imaging now. So we can CT scan the patient on the treatment couch and say, we're good today. There's no bowel there. Um, we'll treat that now. Or if a loop of bowel has come in, you ask the patient here, you go for a good long walk around the hospital and uh, come back to us an hour. We'll try this again. And oh, good, it's moved out of the way. We'll treat. All right. So this wonderful imaging that we've got really advances what we can do. And then I mentioned all those fancy dose calculations before and our ability to irradiate from different angles. Here's a patient who has a solitary metastasis in a vertebra that makes up the spine. Now, obviously, we don't want to treat the spinal cord just there. We must avoid. I don't know what it wants me to delay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we must avoid the spinal cord. We don't want to damage the, the, the patient's spinal cord for obvious reasons. But because we can radiate from all these different angles, we can actually wrap the radiation dose around the spinal cord, completely avoid it. We're still delivering a really big dose to the, the tumor that's there in the spine. So it's, it's something we never would have been able to do before now. So we're, we've done, we've done everything there is in radiotherapy. Well, not really. Technology never stands still, does it? There's always something new around the corner. So what's next for radiotherapy in Aberdeen? Uh, so let me describe what's uh, on the very near horizon. My little thingy keeps disappearing on me. There we go. So online adaptive radiotherapy, we love our acronyms, OART or just art for adaptive radiotherapy. Um, so uh, radiation treatments, as you saw very early on, are planned right at the start of treatment, and then we deliver them over many days. But what if something changes inside the patient over that time? So here's an example uh, of uh, head and neck cancer. This CT scan on the left is our design of the treatment. That's what we want to deliver. And it takes a lot of, uh, quite a few people, a lot of time to produce these plans. It is quite a skilled process, a lot of back and forth with the oncologist. So 10 days later, the patient started treatment. But you can see here, the tumor suddenly got a lot bigger in just 10 days. Now, it's a little bit unusual to have a tumor that grows that fast, but um, it did. And so when we delivered the dose, there was a little bit of the tumor that wasn't getting the dose we wanted it to. So immediately after this treatment, 
we said, come with us back up to the CT scanner. We'll get you a CT scan. We're going to do fast track, get you a brand new treatment plan. So they delivered that treatment that day because it's so fast growing. You want to get that dose in now. Uh, then upstairs CT scanner and the process of redesigning that treatment started in earnest. And on day three, we delivered a completely new treatment plan uh, that accounted for that change. And then it was a 20 treatment days. So with weekends and all that sort of stuff, stuff by the last fraction, it was 38 days since the initial CT scan. And that's the dose that we're delivering. Now you can see the tumor has already started to shrink because of the treatment because we're well down the road now, and it'll continue to shrink, you know, for, you know, quite a while afterwards. Uh, but of course, because everything's shrinking, we're giving a little bit extra dose because things are a little bit thinner, you know. Uh, maybe that's okay because we were a little bit short on the first couple of days. So we're making up for that. Now, the way I colored things makes it look dramatic, but it wasn't, these are slight changes, but we can do better. We can do better than that. And there's several factors that change internal anatomy. It's not just the change in the tumor that I've been describing. Internal organs change all the time. Just think of you know, a patient coming for treatment, a pelvic treatment, and patient coming treat, for treatment each day, the status of the bladder will be different. So things are just natural physiology causes things to change in your body. Also, patients are often not well. Um, if you've been treated in the head and neck, you've got a very sore throat. Eating is, is not a joy. Uh, so patients tend to lose weight over the course of their treatment. So the, the, may have, uh, the distance to the tumor could be a lot less by the time you get to the end of the, the treatment. Um, also, the radiographers do their absolute best to position the patients very precisely. But patients are not machines. They're, they move. They're, they're, they're flexible. So getting somebody to millimeter precision in the right position is not really feasible. Uh, we can get within a few millimeters, but uh, we can, we, can uh, we have ways with adaptive radiotherapy to be more precise. So we want a way to adapt the treatment every single day as though we had taken the patient and CT scanned and re redid the treatment plan every single day, right at the moment of treatment. That's what we want. So in 2022, we got a brand new LINAC called the Varian Ethos. And at the time, it was only the third such machine in the UK. It's about to be the, uh, Glasgow had their uh, Ethos delivered last Saturday, but uh, not to be outdone, we've got our second Ethos coming. Um, <laughs> Uh, day after tomorrow is coming in. And so it'll be the fifth such machine in the UK. Um, at any rate, it's capable of online adaptive radiotherapy. Now we didn't go day one and say, we're gonna do adaptive radiotherapy today. Just cross our fingers, yeah, it'll work, it'll be fine. No, we do everything very, very carefully uh, because we have patients at the end of the day. We, our primary responsibility is the care of the patient and, you know, law number one, do no harm. Uh, so to deliver adaptive radiotherapy, there's been a huge amount of work going into that. And I'm pleased to see our first fully adaptive patient will be treated in about a week. So it's just around the corner and this is what's coming. So let me just tell you a bit about how it all works. The uh, online adaptive process starts same as before. We get a CT scan of the patient. The uh, oncologist, he or she, will outline the bits to be treated and all the vital organs say, don't really eat that kidney uh, or don't give a dose above this up to that kidney, that sort of thing. Um, and then, uh, RV team starts here and says, okay, we'll take all the doctor's instructions and we'll come up with the best possible plan that meets all those criteria. And the oncologist comes, looks at it, goes, couldn't you get a little bit more there and a little bit less there? And 
the symmetry is going, okay. And, you know, all that sort of thing. And he comes up with the absolute best treatment that they can for that patient, okay? So the old way of doing it would have been, you know, day one, there's our, our true being and our friendly radiography staff. They CT scan the patient again on, on the bed. They align the patient to the original CT scan as best they possibly can, and then deliver the originally designed treatment. And we see that happens on day one, day two, day three, here's day 10, later on, and in this example, day 20. Um, we do do treatments that run 35 treatment days. So they, they can be on the during treatment a lot longer. Um, so that's the way things work now. And we saw that we see some variations. So some days the dose might be a little bit lower. Some days it's just right. And some days it's too much, a bit like Goldilocks, you know? Uh, so now adaptive therapy works a slightly different way. We patient comes to the machine, our new ethos machine, and it's got a lot of associated computing power. Oops. So this whole rack on the left-hand side, that's to do with adaptive treatment. So what we do is we see, get, acquire another CT scan, just like we did on the true beams. But now, with the assistance of artificial intelligence, the software puts new contours on to match the way the tumor and the organs look that day, not just on the day of the original CT scan. And then uh, it, it asks the, the radiographers, are you happy with that? And they tweak this and they tune that and all of it here. Okay, we're happy with that. And then the machine, based on the original plan, generates a new best plan, accounting for all these changes in shape. And then they deliver that best new best plan, the one planned on the day at the moment of treatment is the thing that's delivered. So then they do day one, day two, day three, and so on. And each day that they treat, things are just right. And that's adaptive treatment. So radiotherapy technology is advancing quickly. I run a little team and we deal with uh, technology and you think, oh yeah, we're just all about computers and technology. But our goal is to use that technology for the benefit of our patients. Because at the end of the day, there's a person on, at the end of this, a person who, who desperately wants to be well again. And that's what we're aiming for. So let me just thank uh, the radiotherapy team that actually consists of 57 people. And we have oncologists, the radiographers, they're the sort of patient-facing people. And behind the scenes, we have physicists, engineers, and dosimetrists all working to achieve these sorts of treatments. I especially want to thank our partners, friends at Anchor, um, because they've been uh, great all along the way of making the, this whole journey for patients so much better. It's a tough time in people's lives, and so it helps a lot. In addition to that, they help keep the staff morale up because we just love these monthly lunchtime treats that we're getting. <laughs> Uh, but they've also funded vital equipment. So they funded a film dosimetry system that was vital in getting Saber up and running quickly. And, and for us to be so much more confident in the Saber treatments that we're delivering. They funded research in, in Saber, in radiotherapy. One of our oncologists, Kirsten Laws, benefited from that. But also their reach goes well beyond radiotherapy into chemotherapy and surgery and so much more. So uh, at any rate, that's their, their website there. I'm sure they would be delighted with your support. And uh, let me finally just thank all of you for sitting here and letting me babble on for the last however many time, time that I have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay. <laughs> That was um, amazing, really. <laughs> uh, so, um, anybody have any questions for John? I'm guessing some of you might be from ARI, would I be right? ARI and Friends of Anchor. All right, <laughs> brilliant. I, I find it gobsmacking because I, I used to work in um, radiotherapy a little bit back in the days when we used to cut 
do the beam shaping by cutting shielding blocks and, and beam tailoring was done by cutting missing tissue compensators out of wax and so on. It was all very labor intensive and I was one of those with the calculator and the tables doing the calculations. So I, I look at this and I just think it's amazing. It's incredible. I, I really think so. The old days were fun, but the, the new days are They better. didn't know it's, <laughs> it's so much better for patients nowadays without any shadow of a doubt. So, um, so yes. I, I just wanted to say that I've been retired for 10 years, but when I started my nurse training, which was in 1968, and I remember working in dining wards and people went for reading packs. Yes, um, there's a type of treatment called brachytherapy, where they actually, for gynecological cancers, would actually put in um, Radio, well, in the old days, it was radio sources in, into the, the uterus or bricks, yeah. that sort of thing. I was just thinking how far the mm, Yeah, we still do brachytherapy. It yeah. is a very effective treatment for a certain number of treatments, but uh, by far the, our biggest group are these uh, external beam treatments. And most of our gynae uh, patients start with external beam, and then we boost the dose with brachy at the end. Uh, but yeah, it, it was, was and, and still is a, a perfectly good treatment. Um, I can understand the, the CTs used with, with x-rays to get your imaging, but what, what exactly is firing out of the Linux? Is it just what we call proton therapy or is oh. it electrons or? Great question. Um, so radiation is sort of a catch-all term for a lot of things. So basically, there, there are a finite number of particles. So x-rays, whether they're coming out of Röntgen's x-ray tube or coming out of one of our Linux, are actually that's, this, that's photons. Yeah, exactly, photons. So the difference there is uh, the x-rays that come out of the x-ray tube that takes a picture of your arm, that's quite low energy. The ones we treat with, are about a thousand times more energetic. Um, so what's that, an electron beam or is it no, photons again? No, they're just photons again. So they're both x-rays, it's just what we treat with is much higher energy than what we image with. Okay. So they're the same thing, but we can also treat with electron beams. So we have high energy electron beams that we use generally for quite superficial treatments because electrons can't penetrate very far. So skin cancers and so on use electron beams. Protons, you mentioned, and that uh, is a, a form of treatment and becoming more and more common. We, uh, the UK NHS has installed two proton beam treatment machines, one in uh, University College Hospital in London and one in Manchester. And uh, it's good for very specialized treatment, particularly for uh, pediatric children when they're treating things near the base of brain. The protons are very good at going a certain distance into tissues, and just stopping. So they can be really precise about where they stop. And so that's what's great about protons. But it, it's horses for courses. Yeah. You wouldn't use protons for, for some, certain kinds of treatments because there's no benefit or even a detriment to using protons. So you choose the radiation that's going to work for the given clinical situation. It's so a good all, question. So all your treatments are basically on the x-rays, but just at different levels. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else got any questions? This is probably a naive question because I think this is my first medical lecture. But what are the um, side effects to using the newer technology as opposed to the, the older one? So uh, uh, yes. So I mentioned how radiation uh, tends to damage cancer cells more than normal cells. Um, but normal cells actually come in two different types. There's ones that uh, proliferate quickly, they, they divide quickly, and they tend to be more sensitive to radiation. So cells that line your gut or the linings of your throat and so on in your mouth are badly affected by radiation. And you, you notice big changes in taste if you're having your head and neck treated and things like that. Um, the tissues that tolerate the radiation better are the ones that turn over slowly. Uh, so the longer term side effects are reduced if, uh, if you design the treatment right. 
but the side effects you have depends on where you're treating. So um, we, we know that there will be short-term acute effects that are, can be very unpleasant, very hard to live with. Uh, we, we work hard to avoid any effects that are going to last a long time. Sometimes it's unavoidable, um, and you try to balance the damage you're doing with radiation against the good you're doing. Much like a surgeon, so imagine a surgeon trying to cut out a brain tumor, and it, uh, he or she knows that the uh, impact on the patient will depend on how much you're removing, and you don't want to go too far into the normal tissue, but tumors don't have a nice, that's the end of the tumor and the rest is normal. They, they sort of have little tendrils and microscopic spread into the surrounding tissue. So it's hard to say. Uh, so it's about, um, for uh, a lot of the treatments we give, they're very successful patients lead, you know, uh, a healthy life without any too, too many ill effects from the treatment that we've delivered. And that's our goal, always. Well, I think we've, <laughs> we've got it all. So um, that's great. Just before I wind things up, can I just say to you, this is um, the 29th time that TechFest has done a science festival uh, public program. Uh, we've been going for quite a while. In the autumn, we're going to be celebrating our 30th anniversary, and we will have a special splash of, of programs, of talks, of activities for all age groups. And uh, we'd really like you to be part of this. So I would encourage you, please, to check us out on Facebook. Uh, check us out on Instagram. I think we're on Twitter as well. Yeah. I'm not. So <laughs> uh, if you if you sort of um, sign up to any of our socials or even you know go to our website, or if you really want to do it the old fashioned way, go to Gabby and sign up for our email list. Um, you'll be able to follow what we do and maybe attend, find other interesting talks and activities that you, you might be into. So I would encourage you to do that and come along and um, try and follow the science and the new technology that, that we've got that's, that's helping us so much. So uh, that's, that's the end of it. We'll say thank you very much to John for a wonderful, fascinating talk. That was great. And thank you all for coming and supporting us and being here and being part of this. And we hope we'll see you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.